So I thought I would start with a question, and uh, you got an enormous amount of access. You found a way to gain the trust of the Pattersons and Mormon, and I expect um, there's an enormous amount of difficulty in navigating those relationships. I'm curious whether they've seen the film, um, and, and given the fact that you've given them both um, a platform to express their, um, their feelings about this case, I'm wondering how they felt. So, of course, um, it was very important to me uh, to show them the film before everyone else saw it. Use the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, of course, it, it was incredibly important for me to show the film to the main characters in it before the wider public would see it. So, um, it was very scary. Um, I showed it to Dee Dee Patterson first, and um, it was incredibly hard because it was really the first time that she was seeing the man that killed her son. Um, but she sat through it, and um, she thought it was very fair. And she understood why um, he was given the screen time that he was. And then I showed it to Norman and his lawyers and Danielle. And um, that was scary, um, but they thought it was very fair. Um, I've got lots of questions, but I do want to open it up to the audience for anyone. Okay. Oh, here we go. According to the man's daughter that you interviewed, why do you think she killed Justin? Why do you think, why does, why does she think her father killed Justin? What was the reasoning in her point of view? She never gave a reason why she thought that he killed Justin. She never gave a reason. Um, um, I actually think it's been very difficult for her to process. Um, I think she's traumatized. And that was really the first time that she talked about it. Um, and I, I honestly think she's incredibly traumatized. And, and that's why she was so effusive, because it was really the first time that she was able to speak because they kept her so far away, because she was a witness. So part of his... Um, his probation was that she's not, she wasn't allowed to see him or talk to him or talk to anyone. So she's been incredibly isolated. So, <coughs> did that answer? No, it's a mystery. It's still a mystery why he shot him, Justin. It's it really, it's crazy. <laughs> yes, right here. Um, an issue that sort of lies outside the, the focus that you had here, but sort of speaks to it, uh, gun control. Yeah, so, I mean, you're in Canada. Welcome to Canada. <laughs> um, people here tend to be, like, totally confused about the gun laws in the States and how they exist as the way they are. Um, what, what is your question? Well, the question, <laughs> the question becomes, would the death even occur if there wasn't a gun present in the household? Obviously not. So that speaks to gun control in general. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I hope that the film. Oh. The question was about. I'm sorry. The question was about gun control and about whether gun control would have prevented this case. Obviously. Um, yeah. I mean, hopefully that you know this film. It's not exactly giving you the answers to anything. It's very complicated. But hopefully, you know, I think it asks more questions than it gives answers. I think that's really true. And it's so interesting to begin your entry point into this town with these photographs. Um, and from my vantage point, I think most people's vantage point, that is a very, um, no pun intended, black and white issue. It's very clear that segregation of proms is awful and horrible and needs to be ended. And what's so interesting here, <laughs> Um, is this transition from a documentary photography context to a film context. And it's not just a difference between medium, it is a complete and total difference in the subjectivity that you have and how you approach it. Can you speak to that a bit? So, 
subjectivity in what in what way? I think that um, you can come at the photographs and the segregated prom uh, with a, with an outlook that is fairly definitive in, in, in how you approach this issue. Um, I have not read that New Yorker article, um, but I have seen those photographs. Um, but what you made in this film is not a black and white issue film. It is a money film. Um, it is about money issues. Right, okay. So I can speak about that because the photographs, um, I, was, I had been photographing there. I first went there to photograph in 2002. And I was pretty haunted, it was on a commission, and I was pretty haunted by the town. And I kept, I went back again and again, and I photographed the segregated proms, and um, I, something inside of me knew that there was a larger story, and that the proms were just a symptom of, of a, a larger picture. And I felt frustrated by, I, I felt like beautiful kids in prom dresses were, were beautiful to look at, but they weren't giving the context of what I was experiencing firsthand. So I really didn't have any tools and I had no skills to make a film. But I felt that I, there was a story that needed to be told and I didn't know how to tell it with my still camera. So I just started to, I taught myself how to make a film, and, and it was a tough learning process, <laughs> a very tough learning process, um, but, but I think that it, this story necessitated it, and, and the, all the nuance um, that I was having a hard time with the photographs, I hoped um, the goal was to capture in film. Other questions? Yes, right here. Um, could you give us just a sense of kind of the context of the town? You know, like how big was it? What? what? Yeah, so it's hard this to... Is a, sorry, I'm just going to repeat it for other people. Uh, this is about the size of the town and the context for the town. So the size of Mount Vernon, which is the, the small town, it's about 4,500 people, but it's part of the larger county. So this was shot in um, a couple different counties that were all neighboring. So, I mean, it's southeast Georgia. It really represents the whole area of southeast Georgia, even though the main characters are from Mount Vernon. And Norman is actually from the next county over, James County. It's known for, the, the reason why people know the places, it's known for their onions, Vidalia onions. Yes, right here. Could you talk about how you decided to merge the two stories? Because at first it's about prom, it's about the kids and the murder and the incident. <coughs> And then you've got this whole election and the sheriff, and I'd like to know how you chose and why you chose. Great, great yes. question. This is a, a beautiful thing that you guys did is to merge the story of the sheriff, uh, the, the Burns, the Calvin Burns election, and the um, the murder. So I think that's what Josh and I struggled with the most, and what was the most challenging of this whole film. Um, well, I can say Kiki um, really wove all the three narratives together. And I went, before I, I mean, I knew Justin's mom from the proms, and I had photographed Siobhan, his brother, of the proms. But I thought I was going to town to, to film the change, the hope. Like, the proms were integrated. I want to tell that story of, of change and what it's like for these kids now in this new generation. And Kiki was one of the girls that I had met years ago, and her father was gonna was running to be the first black sheriff, and he was the first black chief of police. And they really became my family, my home away from home. And so I thought I was gonna tell the story of hope and change through through them. And and you know, years ago he had death threats, and he and when he announced that he was running for sheriff. It was not a possibility, so I was showing the, the happy story, and then I got a call from her that her high school boyfriend, Justin, who she went to the prom with in 2007, was murdered. And I just knew that that, I had to cover that story. So, um, maybe you want to talk about how it would be all. I mean, two things about it. One is that it's actually how it unfolded, as Jillian is saying. Um, the other thing is that, you know, in the title of the film, Southern Rights, R-I-T-E-S, they're all kind of rites of passage that this community is going through. And, you know, one decision that we really struggled with for a long time, we interviewed some incredible experts. Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative, Dr. Khalil Jabban Mohammed of the Schomburg Center at the New York Public Library, and they give these incredible interviews, and we decided 
uh, pretty early on after watching these incredible interviews that we couldn't include them because we needed to let these people speak their own truths about race and about the way that these subconscious racial narratives were infecting all the aspects of their community, whether it was the schools or the election system or the criminal justice system. So I think that's why I was trying to look at this community coming of age around race and all these different aspects of its civic life. Yes, sir. Why do you think this case hasn't gotten as much media attention as some of the most recent cases, whether it's in yeah, this is about Good why. Question. This is about why this case didn't garner as much media attention. <laughs> so um, I don't know what to say. Fortunately or unfortunately, now these stories are making front pages every single what feels like every single day now. Um, and to me, that's actually progress because this is one of so many that don't make it onto the page of the New York Times. So what made me so upset was that it was totally unreported. No one knew about it, no one. And the DA told the Pattersons, even though she trusted me and knew me, she was so scared to talk to me because he told her, if you talk to a reporter, you will lose your case. This is what they thought. So she thought, you know, it's, it's just, it's, don't get me started. <laughs> We have time for one more question right there. Yeah. Most of the racist attitude comes from the senior members of the community, I find out. And because it is such a cultural tradition, our grandparents thought it was right, so it must be right. Do you see any hope with the younger generation being integrated within the school system and that with moms that these attitudes might change over the next 20, 30 years? Oh. Is there hope that the attitudes might change? Oh, sorry, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, from the time that I was there first in 2002 until now, it's just, it's dramatically different. Um, I think so, because it's it's all about the youth. When I was there in 2002, there were, you, you would never, mixed race couples, you hid that. That was, you could get in a lot of trouble. Now, there are mixed race couples everywhere. It's, it's really, things are changing, and the, the hope is in the youth. That was a short question. Can I fit in one more? Awesome. Right here. I'm just wondering if you're going to screen it in the town or any nearby towns or in Atlanta or anywhere. Yeah, are you going to screen it in Georgia? Can I just add one more thing to the previous question? Um, you know, th I think that the at the end of the movie does show that Julian is saying the hope in the younger community. One thing that is very problematic is that the way that this these racial narratives work has so infected our criminal justice system in the United States. Um, and it's going to take a very long time to undo that. Currently, you cannot bring up race in any criminal proceeding unless the charge is a hate crime. So we have removed from any criminal proceeding even a conversation about race. And obviously, that is not the way that we as human beings deal with each other. So it's going to take some time, and it's going to take a lot of young attorneys who want to change things, and that's one thing we hope this film will inspire, is that kind of work. To the second question about screening in Georgia. Oh, okay. So um, we're doing a, um, a screening in Atlanta at the Civil Rights Museum, and um, a lot of the people from the town are going to come. Um, I'm a little afraid to screen in the town. Um, I do have this fantasy. My husband was just saying that he has this fantasy of doing a huge drive in um, <laughs> in the town where everyone came, but um, I think I'd have to Skype. <laughs> um, so, but I'm excited. It's important. I, it was really important for me to do something in Atlanta because this is their own backyard that they don't know that this is going on. I mean, it's three hours from Atlanta, so I'm excited for that screen. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing. This with me. Really quickly, just want to thank Pop Docs. This is an incredible, incredible festival. It's an amazing city. There's such incredible support for documentary films here. It's an incredible honor to be here. Oh, and, and <laughs> I am very interested. Um, obviously, this is the first time that I've shown it in a theater. I'm really interested in feedback. So, I, I, the whole point, the reason why I made this film is because I, I like to 
initiate conversation that's hard to have. So there is a Facebook page, and if you have any comments, I'd love to hear. So it's Southern Rights Facebook page. Final thing, so I just want to send a, a big shout out to one of our uh, main editors, Nancy Novick, the two editors. She was the first editor involved with from the very beginning. She's here tonight. Right.